The British didn't even bother to bring their pre-dreadnoughts, in other words, ships that that didn't have uh, what were designed as an all-big gun ship. They didn't even bother to bring them to sea. The Germans did, because they had a considerable disparity, uh, clearly, and they hoped that even the free duck dreadnoughts, although they were slower, did not have the right armament, but would contribute to, to a, a fleet action. The next line is a very interesting one. It's called a battle cruiser. A battle cruiser, backing up a little bit, a battleship, like any ship, is a, is a, is a compromise in design between speed, armament, and armor. In other words, the speed to, to outmaneuver an opponent, uh, heavy guns to, to inflict damage on the opponent, and armor to protect itself. Um, and it's a, it's a balanced, uh, careful design that naval architects have to work, had to work with. And, uh, and Lord Fisher had, had the idea that he would build a cruiser which was uh, fast and it had heavy guns but it would have light armament. And the idea was not that the ship would serve in, as in the line of battle, but it would be dispatched around the world. It was bigger, faster than anything anybody else had, and it would be uh, used essentially to enforce the, the imperialist policies of the, of the British government. So here we have a ship that, that carries the same heavy guns as a battleship, is uh, it's faster than a battleship, but has very little armor. Both sides had battle cruisers, uh, but as we shall see, the Germans built them better than the British. What was the German strategy? The British, the main British force was located at Scapa Flow in the Orkneys. Uh, huge natural harbor, and it has been the main harbor of the British fleet, it may still be, I don't know. Um, but it's a huge natural harbor. But <clears throat> it was, the battle cruisers, the bulk of them, were in Edinburgh, in the Firth of Forth. And it was called a battle cruiser fleet. And the, it was the battle cruisers of the, uh, of the Navy, and four very modern, in fact, the most modern battleships the British had, who, which besides being very well protected, as any battleship would be, was also very fast. So they could keep up with the battle cruisers. Okay, that said, so the British fleet essentially was divided. You have the main part of the force coming from the Orkneys, and you have the other part of the force coming from the Firth of the Forth in Scotland. So the German strategy was to take part of their force, there are five battle cruisers that were on the preceding chart, send them out, and if it was just them, the British wouldn't react. In fact, they hadn't reacted at the Battle of Dogger Bank and Helicopter and Bite. They hadn't reacted, so they knew this was a, a very viable thing to try to do. But send their battle cruisers out, and the British got wind of that, they'd send a battle cruiser fleet up, and then the high seas fleet would ambush them, ambush the battle cruiser. So they would, battle cruiser fleet, so they would take a big chunk out of the British fleet by concentrating their force against just a part of the British fleet. That was their strategy. So they had to be careful and not let the British know that the high fleet was at sea. Well, that that was impossible because of what I'm going to tell you in a minute. Uh, the commander of the Grand Fleet was a chap named Admiral Sir John Jellicoe. He uh, he was given the the opportunity, as it was put, to be quote Nelson at Trafalgar, namely the great naval hero of Horatio Nelson at the decisive battle in in the First World War. Nelson at Trafalgar. Well, it didn't turn out that way. Uh, and partially because of this fellow, this dashing fellow here, is Admiral Sir David Beatty. 
he was the uh, commander of the battle cruiser fleet, and you can tell from the rakish uh, uh, cast of his cap and his, his general demeanor, he was like that, that he was uh, uh, brave, uh, intelligent, but impetuous, impetuous officer. And he was, he's the type of officer that charges into the guns uh, before thinking very, very much. And that particular characteristic was uh, to lead the British ill. That characteristic plus an intelligence failure. And we'll get to that. This is the HMS Lion. It was uh, Beatty's battleship. <coughs> not a very good picture. But then most pictures we have are not that good because it, this was 100 years ago. And the movies are, are not very good either. I'm gonna, I do have a clip, but the quality is not what it should be. It, 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 was, it is what it is, but it's, it's uh, not as good as I'd like it to be. Commander of the High Seas Fleet was uh, Reinhold Scheer, a very capable naval officer, and as with the British, he had made the Navy his career. He was a very uh, clever man, and uh, well, sorry. This is his flagship SMS. Uh, SMS means His Majesty's Ship in German, and it, it's the same as the British HMS, His Majesty's Ship. Koenig is a battleship, uh, 13 and a half inch guns, uh, flagship of the, of, the, of the high seas fleet, and they had uh, roughly 15 uh, battleships, about, uh, this one was probably the top of the line, but they had, they had smaller ones, but they're all fully protected uh, men of war of the, of the 20s, early 20th century. Now, the fellow who, uh, who really came out of this battle with a tremendous amount of credit is this guy, uh, Admiral Franz von Hipper. And he commanded the battle cruiser fleet. And he was everywhere in the battle. And his ships took a tremendous amount of pounding. Only one of them sank, though. The others managed to make it to port. They were terribly, uh, terribly damaged, and I have a picture of one of them. But he was a guy who, who uh, took the initiative and did what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to draw Beatty out, and uh, he did so. Now, we need to talk about intelligence, because intelligence is a very important part of war. Uh, in, in 2010, 2011, and we know how important it is, and it's very sophisticated. I was in the intelligence business. Uh, it's, it's a matter of putting together information and getting it to the decision maker. It's a matter of identifying what the enemy is doing. Normally you can't tell what his intentions are, but you can identify what military call his capabilities. What is he capable of doing? The British had an ace in the hole in the first war, and they had one in the second. I referred to it previously in the, in the, uh, the Gothenburg talk. But they had an ace in the hole. The ace in the hole was room 40. Called that because it was room 40 in the Admiralty offices. The British realized uh, that they needed a means of intercepting and reading the German wireless communication. And so they gathered uh, people who like to solve puzzles. They gathered linguists from Oxford and Cambridge. They gathered mathematicians. And they put them together in room 40. And of course, there were a few naval officers as well. But uh, the, the bulk of the work and the bulk of the analysis and the like were, were performed by people who were civilians before the war and, and except for a few remained civilians after the war. They got lucky early in the war. A uh, German cruiser named the Magdeburg uh, won aground in, at the mouth of the Gulf of Finland where we just were. In fact, they ran aground uh, on an island off Estonia. It, uh, the code book 
is a very crucial part of payroll operations because it's used essentially to help people help direct the, the actions and the movements of the chip. And what it is, uh, is you take a bunch of phrases, and, and the, the book is very thick, and it's used in commercial. Western Union had a gold code book. But it's used in, in commercial as well as military operations. And essentially says, you know, meet me at the store tomorrow, and it'll be reduced to a, generally a group of five characters, whether it's uh, letters or, or numbers or some combination of both. So, so when you get, uh, one, two, three, A, B, you look it up in the code book and they'll tell you what, what you're supposed to know. Uh, and this is used in naval operations and it's a very vital document. And it's a very secret document. Code books normally, uh, at least in the Second World War, but uh, they're water-soluble paper and if you're, you're in a ship and it's in danger of being taken out, taken by the, by the enemy, you, toss it overboard and it dissolves. Or before that, they would put lead covers on the book. So when you tossed it overboard, it would sink to the bottom and it couldn't be used. Uh, well, when this cruiser went aground, the Russians, the Russian Navy, uh, came up pretty quick. And uh, a couple of cruisers started firing at it. And of course, the, the uh, the captain said, get rid of the code book because we're not getting off this rock. And the seaman, presumably, this is the story anyway, jumped overboard very, very bad with the, with the code book in his, in his hands and you know, sacrificing himself to save the code book. Well, he didn't make it. I guess he landed in shallow water or whatever, but the, the, the Russians recovered the code book. Very important document. And uh, they couldn't use it. They didn't have the capability of, of uh, they weren't a naval power to speak of. And, 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 but they allies were the, with the British. And so the, the British sent a heavy cruiser through the Gulf of Finland to pick it up. And that's how important it was. So they got that. And then they captured a couple of other ships, one of them in, off Australia, whatever. And they recovered enough of the code books to give them, were they able to at least get the, get the coded messages, and to be able to read what, you know, what the, the Germans were saying to each other. And uh, what a window into, uh, into uh, operations, a tremendous advantage. Now, it's not normally done in those days to just transmit the stuff that's in the code book, it would be enciphered. In other words, to take eight, one, two, three, A, B, it would turn that into something else, uh, a substitution code. Uh, a, uh, uh, there are many codes, some of them very, very difficult to break and to read, but it would, you would not transmit the exact uh, five group, yeah, when you were, especially when you were using wireless. So they would they would they would wrap the code in in a uh, in, in an encipherment, and sometimes they would take that encipherment and then encipher it again. It would be called super encyphered code, and <clears throat> presumably unbreakable. Well, anything made by man can be broken by man, and that's what the mathematicians and the linguists and the uh, folks in room 40 before they did that. They broke the German code. They were able literally to read every German message. And because they could read the message, they knew because it would be signals from the flagship. We, you know, get ready to go and so on. They picked that up in England. And, and so they were able to warn the British fleet whenever the German fleet left, left port. They also